Remember high school biology, chemistry, physics, each with its own facts, theories, principles. Learning one did not help learning another. But over the years, the more I saw science advance, the more I sensed down deep, striking similarities. We all search for meaning. Could striking similarities in science be clues? Two questions. One, do general principles really exist in nature, independent of human thought? Or are they artificial, constructs of human thought? Two, if general principles do exist, what would they mean about the universe and about us? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. What do animal species, business corporations, and geographic cities have in common? Nothing, you say? Well, nothing on the surface. But dig beneath and find striking similarities. These similarities are general principles. And I begin with a physicist who personifies general principles, Jeffrey West. Jeffrey is past president of the Santa Fe Institute. Jeffrey, I was trained in brain science. I've worked in uh, corporate strategy, investment banking, uh, media, and I seem to sense that some of the same principles that are deep at work in science also affect these other areas. Is this an illusion of reading into it, or is there some reality here? Well, there are very broad principles that operate across the entire spectrum of physical phenomena, whether they be evolution of galaxies to the development of Google. <laughs> and those may well have a universality. So for example, a phenomenological law, which presumably we can understand, is why we live a hundred years. I mean, of the order of a hundred years, not a million years, a thousand years, or 10 years. Right. And a mouse lives only two to three years, even though we're made of the same stuff. Now, we ought to be, underst ought to be able to understand that, and we ought to have a mechanistic, quantifiable, mathematical theory of aging and death that explains that, but will not be able to explain, of course, when you're going to die right. or when I'm going to die. Right. Life has been around for several billion years. It goes from the very microscopic up to, you know, the whale, which is the biggest uh, multicellular organism that's ever existed, to ecosystems. And this has persisted in a robust way for billions of years and in an integrated way. Even though it adapts, it adapts over very long periods of time. Nevertheless, for this to remain resilient, it cannot be arbitrary. That is, there have to have been what we call emergent laws. That is, there are laws that at each level, whether it be the microscopic, subcellular, sub all the way up to the ecosystem, that these systems obey. And this is typical of complex systems. And this would apply to whether it's uh, biological systems yes. or totality of the earth, as you're saying, life yes. itself, or even uh, social systems yes. like corporations so, and cities. And the evidence for that is by looking at what we call scaling phenomena. Let's take biology first. You look at a physiological variable like metabolism, and you ask, how does that change with size? A priori, you would say, well, since each organism, each subsystem, each cell type has evolved in its own unique environmental niche, historically contingent on its, you know, all the various accidents that happened during evolution, there'd be no real relationship. You know, if, you, if I looked at a plot, metabolic rate on the y-axis, so. size on the x-axis, it'd be all over the map. When you actually plot it that way, you see something extraordinarily regular unbelievably regular and very simple. So this is astonishing because we have uh, the most diverse and complex phenomenon probably in the universe, yet 
it exhibits this extraordinary simplicity when we look at it as a scaling phenomenon. So what do we learn from that? What do you learn from that is the blue whale is a scaled up mouse. <laughs> and that if you tell me the size of a mammal, it, this is its weight, I will tell you pretty much everything about it, about its physiology and about its life history, how many children it's going to have, uh, how long it's going to live, um, how, how, how fast it heart, its heart beats, what is the flow of blood in the ninth <laughs> artery, <laughs> and so on. All to about 85-90% accuracy. But that's fantastic because it says that underlying this fa fantastic and apparent diversity is an extraordinary simplicity and regularity that can be put into a mathematical framework. And we can ask, what is it that has constrained this complex adaptive system to express such simplicity? From the mouse to the blue whale, general principles work away. Things that do not look the same, work the same. Interesting, sure, but is it more? Is major meaning lurking here? I go to Cambridge, England, to ask a protean thinker on the whole of science, the astronomer royal, Martin Rees. Physics is the one subject where we do expect exact theories to be a very good approximation. Uh, that's less so when we get up to complex phenomena. But of course, there are some surprising regularities, uh, so-called scaling laws between properties of objects and their size, for instance, and of course, regularities in the behavior of living things. Um, the uh, mathematical law related to so-called fractals that determines the patterns that we see in a whole range of of plants and also ecological systems, etc. And of course, another important insight comes from the realization that simple laws, simple prescriptions can have very complex consequences. I mean, the most famous classic example is John Conway's Game of Life, where he uh, just devised a, a simple game on a checkerboard uh, where you have very simple rules, but following through those rules, you can get a variety of structures, even reproducing structures. And that's obviously a very interesting metaphor, which does show that you can have complex consequences from very simple laws. In ecology, one has learned that uh, simple laws can lead either to random behavior or to a pantechaotic behavior. So I think there are ways in which surprisingly simple mathematics, surprisingly simple laws can have wide applicability. And that's one way in which scientists can provide interdisciplinary insight by showing that there are links between different levels in the hierarchy of complexity. How do you see the, the flow of mathematics uh, uh, among the different uh, hierarchies of, of knowledge? When things are complicated, even if we can uh, understand them, that doesn't mean we can predict them. That's true of the weather, it's true of the behavior of animals. And I think uh, one can explore the options by uh, taking large samples by statistics. And I think an increasing role is being played by computer simulations. Certainly in my own subject of astronomy and astrophysics, where we can't obviously do experiments on stars and galaxies, the advances have been hugely beneficial because we have the possibility to do experiments in the virtual world of our computer. We can crash galaxies together, see how they form, etc., and compare that with the, the real world. And that sort of technique is going to take over in more and more areas. Since computer simulations operate at such extreme scales, from drug molecules to cosmic galaxies, what follows? What is it about computer simulations, or about the fields they affect, that allows such effectiveness? I'm still troubled. Do these general principles reflect reality, or do we impose them on reality? They reflect reality, I believe, but I hesitate. Worry that even asking the question in some sense shapes reality. I need unifying and recurring principles that cut across fields. One may be complex systems and self-organization. 
I ask a pioneer in biological systems, a medical doctor and biochemist, an iconoclast, Stuart Kaufman. I asked Stu about these so-called general principles. So I'm going to give you an example, and it applies in chemistry. It may apply in biology. It virtually certainly applies in economics, and there may be a way to find it applying in the abiotic universe. So we have this two-dimensional coordinate system. On this axis is the number of distinct kinds of monoclonal antibodies, namely identical antibodies. One, ten, a hundred, a thousand, so that it's an exponential. And on this axis, the number of kinds of organic molecules. It's a theorem that there is a sort of hyperbolic curve in this space that separates what I'm going to call subcritical from supercritical. Suppose that the probability that an antibody molecule catalyzes a reaction is one in a billion. Take two organic molecules that can undergo one, two substrate, two product reaction, put them in a pot with that one monoclonal antibody. Well, nothing's gonna happen. Right. It's 10 to the minus ninth. So a subcritical system has the property that it either makes no or only a few new kinds of molecules. But if you're above this curved line, there are so many reactions being catalyzed by so many molecules that you make new molecules, but they undergo new reactions that can be catalyzed by the same molecules. So you make still more new molecules. Mm. So the whole thing just explodes forever. It's like a nuclear bomb. It's critical well, it, let me tell you in economics. It's the same thing, exactly the same idea. On the, this axis, put down the number of production capacities that you have, like hammers and nails. And on this axis, put down the number of things that you've got in the economy that the production capacities might work mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. like a couple of boards you want to nail together. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Two boards come together, get nailed, and they make two nailed boards. Mm -hmm. That's like a chemical reaction. And the production capacity is like catalyzing the reaction. It's a theorem that there's a hyperbolic curve. It's the same curve in this space, too. Below it, you're subcritical. It's a subcritical economy. Above it, you're supercritical. So let's point to a supercritical economy. The U.S. economy and the global economy are making an increasing diversity of goods and services. In fact, we've grown from 1,000 goods and services 50,000 years ago to billions now. It's because we are now supercritical. But let me tell you a subcritical economy. I lived in Alberta at the University of Calgary for five years. They make four things, beef, timber, oil, and wheat. They're not supercritical, yet they have everything that the Washington consensus says that they need to grow. They have a superb infrastructure, highly educated people, stable money, a good banking system, uh, and a lot of money in the provincial coffers from the oil. They're not making new goods and services. Why not? Well, they're not supercritical, that's why. The richer the economy is in terms of good services and production functions, the more it grows and the richer it is. Do you see that as something that you have uh, invented or something that really exists at the fundamental structure of reality? I think that A, I discovered it, didn't invent it. I think it's extremely robust. Notice that it's independent of the specific molecules, it's independent of the specific goods, it's independent of the specific species. If you were to change the constants of nature and could still make complex molecules that could react, you get the same thing. So it doesn't depend upon the physics of our universe. It's not reducible to physics. It's something new. I believe Stu makes a radical claim. There are general principles at work in the universe that do not depend on fundamental physics. All kinds of complex systems function similarly, Stu says, according to their densities or concentrations from languishing subcritical to mushrooming supercritical. Another general principle that seems resident in reality, happening without human invention. Now, what could general principles mean? I push the boundary. I ask how large or all-encompassing might these vast similarities be? 
What's an extreme example of general principles? I meet a philosopher who works at the interface of science and religion. Winner of the Templeton Prize for progress towards research or discoveries about spiritual realities. Holmes Ralston III. Holmes, in trying to understand reality, the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe, is something everybody focuses on. You talk about three Big Bangs. Why? That's right, three Big Bangs. First Big Bang, 13.7 million billion years ago, maybe. Uh, an explosion, uh, an inflation shortly after the initial explosion, but then an expanding universe ever since. Uh, and you may say, well, it's a huge universe. Do we need one that big? It turns out we do if we're going to have any heavy elements, heavier than hydrogen, for example. They're made in the stars, and that takes a lot of cooking time. That means oxygen, that means uh, iron, that means nitrogen, that means the atoms in our bodies. We are, if you like, uh, fossil stardust. I do think that first Big Bang looks like a setup, necessary but maybe not sufficient for the second Big Bang. Now, the second Big Bang is life on Earth. The radical difference about life on Earth that makes it explosive is genetic coding. And what that means is you can have radical innovation. You can store, elaborate, information, and so we've had somewhere in the range maybe of five billion species of life come and gone on Earth. The third Big Bang is in the human mind. Now you may say, well, animals have minds, and they do, but the thing about humans that's radically different is we can pass ideas from mind to mind. The human mind is the most complex thing in the known universe. Humans have the capacity for what I call cumulative transmissible cultures. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can uh, huh? make my point huh? by putting on my uh, thinking cap, huh? as I will do now, right? Mind the gap. Mind the gap. <laughs> There's something about the human mind that's that's crossed a radically different threshold. Do you see the three Big Bangs with any larger implication, a transcendent implication, because there are these three Big Bangs? Well, I do. I think now we need a concept of nature which is adequate to explain these three Big Bangs, not just matter energy, but matter energy that gains the capacity to take on information, to elaborate and enrich information, and in such way that humans appear who have the capacity to think about meaning and significance in life, to kind of, what shall we say, a logos, perhaps, that the universe in, at least uh, can generate mind and so we need a cosmology that's adequate to these explosive big bangs. Holmes has an ultimate general principle, a big bang. He sees three of them, three big bangs, one each for universe, life, and mind. Holmes invokes a theological word, a logos, to explain the unity to provide meaning to the general principles. I'm not surprised Holmes believes in God, but irrespective of God or no God, did the processes by which universe, life, and mind each come about reflect deep structural similarities? I do see similarities in that each emerged radically, shockingly, but there are so many differences in scale, laws, and time frame that I question the explanatory relevance. At its core, then, what are general principles? 
I go to Oxford to meet a visionary whose worldview is based on quantum mechanics, computation, the nature of knowledge, and evolution. David Deutsch. David focuses on objective truth and good explanations. I think the idea that all sciences are integrated by their principles at the fundamental level is, is correct and has to be correct. Um, an obvious um, uh, principle that, that unites all science is just the principle of testability, that, that uh, the uh, truth about nature takes the form of testable theories. I think that the principle of testability is a special case of a much more general principle, the principle of good explanation. A good explanation being one that is hard to vary while still accounting for what it purports to account for. Well, uh, there are things that perhaps are good explanations that cannot be testable. Uh, what I like in music, I may like uh, Mahler's Second Symphony and you may like uh, uh, Brahms' First Symphony as yes. your favorite. Now, those are real facts about the world, but they're certainly not testable in any way. But they might have a good explanation. But this idea of a good explanation reaches beyond science into even, you mentioned aesthetics, even aesthetics. It, it's customary to say so-and-so is a matter of taste to mean there is no truth of the matter. Yes. But I think that cannot be so. I think there is a truth of the matter. It really is objectively true that, for example, Mozart is better, produces better sounds, more aesthetic sounds than cavemen uh, uh, banging rocks together. And although we may not have a sophisticated enough knowledge of aesthetics, especially in explicit form, to know which is which, we know that it is there. The, the, the distinction between better or worse exists objectively in aesthetics as it does in morality and in every other area of philosophy. That's a, a, a fairly dramatic statement because to defend it by comparing Mozart to cavemen with their rocks sounds like it makes sense, but now if you compare Mozart to Beethoven or Mozart to Brahms, I don't think you can have an objective it, analysis. Uh, it, what's happening there is that we do not know yet what the, the better way of analyzing these things is. But in that case, is that, is that uh, analyzable even in principle? I think it must be, and for the following reason. You cannot separate these fields, science and aesthetics and so on, totally from each other. As Jacob Bronowski said, for example, you can't do science, you can't make progress in science unless you also have certain moral values, such as tolerance, um, a respect for the truth, and so on. So these things are matters of moral philosophy, but they are essential to science as well. And therefore, they are essential to how the physical world is put together. If you look in sufficiently fine detail at the boundary between all these different fields of philosophy and between philosophy and science, you find they merge into each other and they can't be separated. So basically, you are saying that general systems theory is correct, but it's only correct if we have one general uh, uh, systems theory principle, and that's good explanation. And within that broad category, there are various subsets, including uh, testability. Yes, as far as we know. The aspiration of general systems theory is definitely right. And in all these fields, there is such a thing as objective truth to be found. I yearn for meaning. Though I do not know whether there is meaning to be found, I sense that general principles could be clues. So first, do general principles govern all science? Yes, they do. Consider three kinds. One, general principles that operate in diverse areas, like relating structures and functions. Two, general principles that explain how diverse areas work, such as emergent laws. Three, general principles of knowing truth, effective ways to apprehend reality, such as good explanations, testability, and repeatability. Since general principles do exist, what 
do they mean? Certainly there must be a coherence to reality, perhaps an integrity, a resonance. Some would see in the existence of general principles, the existence of a creator God. All I can say is this, a God may be consistent with general principles, but a God is not required by them. Personally, I'm not given to new age rhythms, the dance of the cosmos and such, but everything does seem interconnected as we get closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>